Okay, let's go ahead and get started right after I hide this. Is this not it? Yeah. 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 Kind of a inception moment. The slides you see up here are actually in Figma. Pretty cool. But yeah, we're recording. Let's get started. Welcome in everyone. Thank you for coming to week three. Um I know midterm season starting up. I had an essay due the other night that sucked, but I know maybe this class is not on the top of everyone's priority. That's okay. Um, we're gonna, you know, try to keep things fun and lighthearted as we get into these other topics. And this week particularly is one of my favorite topics. We'll be dealing with components primarily. And yeah, we're really digging into the power of Figma today. So let's start to talk about that. And yeah, here's the agenda. Um, we'll get to this later. Uh, once more, please pull up this lecture file on your own. Um, please make a copy of this so you're able to edit it. There's going to be a follow along activity and I've written it on the board in case um, you can't get to it in time. But we're gonna be diving into components. So these are reusable elements that you can use throughout all of your designs. So um, you can make a component out of anything, really. Shapes, icon, images, text, a combination of all of the above. And they're really good at grouping things together into categories so you can maintain consistent design throughout your project. So and you'll notice this is the little component icon denoting that a group or a frame is a component. So over here, we can see that we have a happy and a sad components. And you can see here that this mood is specified by this emotion. What does that mean? Oh, we'll look at that a little bit later. But up here, you can see this sort of like a design system that we're trying to um, create and just Keep consistent. So um, how do they work? So the main component is going to define the properties of the component. And again, they can be an amalgamation of all the different things Figma has to offer. And an instance of the component is a copy of the main component. Um, it's linked back to the main component. And any change you make to the main component will be reflected in the instance of that component. It's really cool because changes in the instance won't be reflected in the main component. So maybe um, throughout your design system, you know, there's a little edge case you need to take care of. That's okay because this instance is not going to throw off the integrity of all of your components. And mm -hmm, yeah call that overriding. And so here's how you find them in your assets panel on the left-hand side. Um, they're all gonna be there. And from there, you can just uh, drag and drop them onto the canvas, which is really awesome. And so here's a keyboard shortcut to get there. And you can also search for and filter through all of your assets to find what you need really quickly. So how might you use components? Um, there are two main ways. So the first way is to create a main component and then use its non-overridden instances throughout the design. So if you wanna make any changes at all to this component, the instances will automatically update to match the main. So for example, this is an icon, maybe this is stages of the progress bar, or buttons with a set style and text. Uh, move this, see the example here. I'm also gonna do this, well, not that. We'll go back here. 
Um, the second way is the way I most commonly use components is to create a main component, but sort of use it as a template throughout my design. So when I create instances of my main component, I can really edit the content and uh, sort of taking advantage of the structural and stylistic choices to keep my design consistent. So over on the right hand side here, you can see like an example calendar. And so this is entirely made up of only two components. So this particular event right here, you can see these are the main components. This is the instance of the component with a change text and date. And so all of these components have the same sort of um, gap between the header and the text. And the it, they all have the same width as well. So when you add more text than you had before, um, your component knows how to handle that. So you can see here, the text is sort of wrapped and goes on to multiple lines and we didn't have to do anything. And this was just, again, because we wanted to keep this sort of width, this calendar UI consistent. And so, yeah, a lot of cards, buttons, and text inputs will follow this template pattern. Some more examples. So they're a lot more creative. Um, here's some game pieces up here. This is like Monopoly houses, um, or excuse me, Catan board game pieces. Not a true gamer. Um, but yeah, there's many different ways to take advantage of these components. And you can see here, like here's a fashion dress up kind of game, customize your character. Here's again, board game tiles. Here's bingo tile sets. Yeah, you can get really fun with these. And yeah, we're gonna move on to variants. And this is sort of where your design system starts to scale. And this is a way to group components that have similar purposes with only minor differences. So it allows you to organize your components and quickly switch between the variants throughout your design. So this is an example of a UI. Maybe this is for an app or a website. You're probably going to have buttons on this app or website. And the designer decided to stick with a color theme, right? We can see that buttons can be red or they can be sort of lavender, purple. Um, this was their choice. And from there, we can sort of take this as button one and button two, right? So here's a button with red, here's a button with lavender. Now, your buttons can also have icons. So what do we do in Figma? We just uh, define a button with an icon. So now this is sort of this column where buttons can have icons and they can be different colors. Now we sort of move throughout the design where we say, okay, these buttons will have different states based on certain behaviors or actions. So what happens when the user hovers over a button? Well, maybe we wanna make the color a little bit lighter. We have to create all these variants of our button component to uh, define this behavior, right? So you can see here, this is sort of like a design system scaling to handle a bunch of different cases and colors. Any questions here? Yeah. In Figma itself, when you like hover, would it like switch it in the color part or is it just still like a concept for when you actually like design it? Um, I'm not sure. I believe there are some pretty awesome things you can do. I think you can take advantage of hover states. Um, it might be a little harder to actually have that work in the prototype, but this is more sort of what you're saying, like a design concept. Um, any other questions? That was a great one. No? Okay, we'll move on. So how do you create, create a group of variants? You can rename components with slash naming convention saw that a little bit earlier. So this is the family they're in. Here's a property one, property two. You can go on for as many properties as you're defining. 
And you can combine the variance um, in the sidebar. I'm actually gonna, oh, why is this being weird? Oh, my computer just decided to, there we go. So let's go back there. This is lecture slide one, awesome. Um, let's see. I guess I'll just go over here to the lecture slide. So you can see we can combine them as variants on the right, and then it becomes a component set, these variants. And so you can see the designer had to specify all of the different states that are within this family of button. And then moving into adjusting and swapping, um, you can select the variant group, and in the right sidebar, you can add more properties edit names of properties, and you can even create properties that use switches, um, sort of these Boolean values like on or off, true or false. And once you made a group, you can drag out an instance of the variant. And then in that sidebar, you can toggle between the state of the variants. And so let's try this again. Nice. Component properties are a more advanced way to customize component elements um, without using variants and are displayed in the design tab. These elements can be customized easily like toggling the visibility of an element, updating an element's text, and swapping instances of the element. So you can see this button has three different properties and we're able to manually toggle between the three to create our desired outcome. Um, here's a bit more detail on the three properties. Uh, variables, we'll talk about that. I really want to get into the demo. I'm going to go ahead and skip around a bit. So hopefully, we've all brought up the lecture slides and copied them over to our own workspace, because we're all going to be working on this demo. <laughs> so, oh, actually. You can see my work from half an hour earlier here. Please ignore that. I'm going to be trying to replicate that. But yeah, I'm going to give everyone, let's say, hmm, five minutes to get through one through three. And then we'll bring it up. And five more minutes to get through the rest of this activity. So yeah, I can be floating around the room if there are any questions. But yeah, please copy this file to your own workspace. Ah, oh, work with a partner. That's the other thing. Gotta work with a partner.
Something that looks like that constant. Yeah, it's just flat down a rectangle. Boom. Boom. There you go. And then that's what it would be. And option A. Oh, yeah, so I recommend it. So effectively, what this is, or any of the building problems, Okay, let's reflect a bit on what we've done. I'm gonna do a little bit of speed running here. So I want to make this card, right? This is gonna be the basis of my design system, this sort of weather app template. So I'm gonna quickly drop a rectangle, boom. Um, that's a little large. I'm gonna go ahead and steal the color of this one, um, changing the fill and then using the dropper tool. And up here, I'm going to round the border a little bit. Okay, cool. Here's my card. I'm gonna slap some text on here. Maybe Berkeley, CA. Um, over here is gonna be cloudy. And I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna make Another font here be the temperature, 56, and it's going to be really big, 32. Okay, cool. I'm also going to cheat and just, oh, this is not cheating. I'm just going to grab this oh, and create a copy, and drag it over here. You might run into some trouble here. My cloud's not showing up. I'm just going to go over on the left-hand side and change the ordering of my layers. So I'm going to drag this cloud to the top so it will oh, 
keep going. So it will appear above all of my other stuff. Great. So with this, I highlight all of these and I do command option K, right? Well, here's some alternatives. Up here at the top, boom, create component. Figma knows this is very popular, um, very integral functionality of the app. So it's right up here at the top, this little component icon, or as always, right click, there's the option, boom. Okay, here's our component. Great. So next, let's go on to step two. Um, on the right-hand panel, click Properties and Add a Variant. Okay, let's do that. Properties over here. I can add a variant. That's cool. Also, at the top, guess what you can do? Add a variant. I'm going to go ahead and click the top button. So now I have a variant. And we want a total of two more. So... Let's also, what am I doing? Grab my component set. I'm going to add another variant here. This is going to be sunny. This is going to be rainy. And here I can sort of change um, the properties here. Boom. Boom, okay. So I think that's good enough. Hopefully everyone can get here. Um, and yeah, now we have our component set with some variants. I'm gonna give everyone five more minutes to walk through the cleaning it up. So now we're here and we need to clean this up. Really quickly, I'm just going to rename this to weather card up at the top instead of uh, component one or whatever it was. But yeah, five more minutes, as always. You know, Let me know if you have questions. Feel free again, we're working with our partners to I need to break off.
Okay, did everyone complete up to step six? I'm gonna give everyone another minute or two to get there. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about this. So we just made this component set, but coming back to it at a later date might not be the best if our naming is variant one, variant three, and default. That might be a little hard to remember. So we're gonna do some cleaning up. So let's reorder the cards so they match the order in the set. So you can see here our default card is last, is that what they wanted to reorganize that? I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna do this. So what I did is I just dragged these components by the pink dot. We'll talk about this a little later in lecture, but I just organized them so they match up in the ordering on the left-hand panel. Can everyone see that? Cool. So now we wanna do some renaming. There's a couple ways to do this. So we can click on the card directly in the right-hand panel. We can see this one is our rainy card, which is currently called variant three. We can switch it to just rainy. So now on the left-hand side, we can see our card is now rainy. Pretty cool. Or right here, we can specify that property one should be um, sunny. So there's a certain syntax you have to follow where this equal sign is assigning um, the property to the variance. And property one, that's kind of a weird name. I'm going to go ahead, come over here and double click this and change it to, I think in this example, it's card. But you know, you can also be like weather or a name that makes sense. So great. Now we have a more well-documented design system, and now we get to use it. So mentioned this before, but where do we find our components we create? The assets panel. So over here, click on, instead of layers, click assets, and you might have to collapse some tabs here. This is going to be in local components. These are components you've created. And click on the page we're currently in. In this case, it's demo. You can also see the lecture slides have some components we've used as well. But in this demo space, you can see here, um, I've actually created multiple. What is this one called? Um, this one's called weather card. I'm going to say weather card now. And in assets, here's my weather card now. I can just drag it. Boom. 
there it is. That's pretty cool. So now I have instances of my main component. And these instances can be toggled through variants. So if I want to change the property on the right-hand side, I'd go over to this component property tab and I toggle this one to cloudy. Oh, oh, my naming's still wrong. Uh, did not change this one. So this is not default. This is card equals cloudy. And so here we are. Here is our weather cards. And immediately you can notice that these instances, right, don't uh, mess up our main component. So typically you'll have these design systems. These components will be grouped together. So you can use them throughout the design. In our instance components, we can, let's say, change the temperature. It's going to be 67 degrees. Notice nothing happened over here. Uh, let's say it gets to like 80 degrees in Berkeley. That'd be crazy. But there it is. Um, maybe this is like partly uh, partly cloudy. That doesn't really fit. But you can sort of mess around right, with these elements, and it won't mess up your main components. Conversely, however, what if we came in here and we decided that this cloudy card should actually be like 40 degrees? What happens? Oh. Did, anyone, did anyone catch that? Our instance over here was updated. So you can see in real time, the instances will be updated if we change the main component. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's make this like a little shorter. Ooh. Um, all of this stuff um, is really beneficial when you have a bunch of these components throughout your design. Um, instead of going through and manually changing all of these elements, when you make an update, you just have to do it once. Very awesome. So let's make a change. Let's introduce a light and dark mode into our weather system. Every app's got to have one nowadays. So let's learn how to design that. Um, I think, hmm, I'll go ahead and give a brief overview of what variables are and then give everyone like five to 10 minutes to go ahead and mock that up. But what are variables? Variables are sometimes just definitions. So you can see here, this is a variable black that maps to the color black. How would you do that? You'd go to our local variables. And you can see here, let's create a new collection. And this is going to be my uh, lecture primitives. Uh, you don't have to match this naming, but I'm just... Given an example, here's a collection of variables I'm defining, and I can create variables that are colors, numbers, strings, or booleans. Oh, I totally forgot. Maybe the slides would be a great resource for this variable overview. So again, yeah, there are reusable definitions, like styles that can be assigned various design attributes. Like again, just set it color, numbers, strings, booleans. Unlike styles, however, Variables can switch between definitions depending on the theme that's applied. So here's a light button, and here's a dark button that we're able to toggle the global state of our design. And so, yeah, four different types of variables. And yeah, let's get into how we're gonna make them. So we can create a variable right here, color, name this like subheading, for example. And I want this to map to red. Actually, this is probably bad. There's going to be a red. Um, so we're trying to create this like hierarchy. So we want red to map to the color red. And we want to create another collection that is like red mode. And this is going to uh, be a color variable that is going to be, let's see, the background. And this is going to map to our red that we've defined. OK, that was confusing. What did we just do? So we created this sort of hierarchy 
of primitives, sorry, variables. So our primitive layer will define the sort of hard-coded value of our colors. So let's say we want a particular black. We can say our black is going to be hex 0000. Our white is going to be hex FFFFF. So then in our higher level collection of themes, we can then map the appropriate background and text to the appropriate color. Um, that might not make sense, but I'm a CS guy. So unfortunately, this makes the most sense to me in code. So what we did is we defined some variables right here that we're able to reference elsewhere in the R design. And then conditionally, we're able to check um, our higher order collection. Are we light mode or are we dark mode? And then depending on that information, we assign the background variable to be the white color and the text variable to be the black color, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so I gave you a very brief intro. Feel free to read through this a little more. Um, but yeah, 10 minutes. Let's go ahead and walk through steps one through six. Okay, I'm actually going to interrupt right here and hopefully bring everyone up to speed, at least part four. So we're making sure we're not selecting any elements. So you can see here the right-hand panel changes. Um, so with nothing selected, we can access this local variables table. So again, we're creating a variable. And I created the red variable in... Where is it? Lecture primitives. So I created this red variable. I'm gonna go ahead and create another one that's called light red. And I'm gonna put a lighter red. So here we are, we have two variables, white and black, red, green, purple, blue, whatever you've decided. And we've mapped them to their appropriate hex value. And again, up here, you can rename it to keep things tidy. So I have my named lecture primitives. And then step five is just creating your higher order collection that is going to have multiple columns. And then we can see here that there's different modes. So we'd have a light, 
and dark mode. So go ahead and play around with that, mapping your colors to their respective value. You can do that by clicking this color, navigating over to libraries, and finding the primitives you've defined right here under all libraries. Uh, yeah, you should have upgraded. You get a uh, Figma premium for free with our Berkeley account. Yeah. I got that error message and I was just Oh, yeah. So, uh, what did you do to solve that here? Uh, yeah, so over here, it's a bunch of collections where you're just going to create a new one and rename it to whatever you want it to be. I called mine red mode. And then from here, you're gonna add another column. Mm -hmm. Does everyone have something like this? A higher order collection with two modes? Mm, we can give some more time and float around the room. If there are any questions? Uh, what? Uh, shouldn't have to. You just have to tell Figma that this is for education. I do not know. But it only has to be used now in development to retain the number of students. <laughs> Is it gonna like do anything weird? Okay. <laughs> okay, that's the same thing, yeah. Oh, um, I need to go to New York. But yeah, so don't, you're copying this over to your own workspace. So these are like our lab teams that you're doing work. So do you want us to? No, no, no. <laughs> I might be in the center. <laughs> you should not be putting this in the lab team. You should be copying this into like a personal team. 
yeah, personal scene that is education. So Figma knows that this is something to apply premium to. Um, I did as well, but it's not uh -huh. you have to so in your teams here, yeah, yeah, so yeah, like tell your team that it is a thing. Oh, wow. Are we looking for like similar players that we do? I guess, does everyone see this file? Like when you were adding teams, did we see this lecture follow along team? I guess that I see, I see someone did, someone found it. This, this would be an okay spot to put it. Oh yeah, no. Also, you could just show people how to switch it to an educated one. Um. Uh, let's see if I remember how. So you see on the left-hand side, you probably have created a team, hopefully, for personal use. You're going to want to click, click this and upgrade to professional, I think. And then you tell Figma that this is an education team. And then because you've already verified your account as a valid education account, this will be for free. Hopefully that makes sense. And yeah, please stick all future files in that team that you create for personal use. What do you mean? Wonderful. That is awesome. Um, in the interest of time here, I'm going to go ahead and walk through this. Please feel free to catch up and hopefully get this created uh, and the education uh, stuff figured out. But hopefully we have something like this, this higher order collection that has a collection of variables that have different modes we can toggle between. So how do we apply these variables we've created? Well, we because we've made colors, let's go over to our components and say that we want to fill this component with the background color that we've defined. OK, that didn't seem to do anything. Let's try this really quick. Wait, did it do something? That's so weird. Oh, there it is. What did I do? Yeah, I specified this element, it should have a fill. And then I mapped that color to the color we've defined in our higher order collection. Right, so I'm mapping this background color to the background color we defined in your hopefully light mode or dark mode collection. Yeah, because I had a, an additional rectangle that was being covered. Uh, oh, that's because I think I had this entire thing highlighted when I should have been highlighting its rectangle. Like this rectangle we've made. Yeah. So yeah, let's grab our rectangle inside each weather component and set its fill to be our background. 
That's cool. We can see our instances have updated also to match this background color. And then what we can do is really cool is we can change the mode we're in. So because we've mapped our components background to match this collection, when we change the state of the collection, our background reflects this change of state. So here again, I've defined globally that my mode should be dark. And I can toggle between the two modes I've defined. That's pretty cool. You can also, at a more granular level, click on this component individually and then apply. Uh, uh, um, right here in the layer property, you can access variables. And Figma is smart enough to infer that this component is using a variable. Notice how red mode, for me, it's red mode. Um, red mode automatically picks up, even though I also have a dark mode defined. Figma knows that the background of this rectangle is reliant on a variable I have used in red mode. So it's just right there, really handy for me. And there I can manually override it to be light. So I have actually, hopefully this makes sense, a chart if you want to learn more about the inheritance of components and variables. But in the interest of time, I'd like to return to lecture. So hopefully that was fun. Hopefully we learned a bit. Components, they're really awesome. You're going to be doing a lot of them in this class. Any questions before we move on? No, nope. awesome. Okay, so we have some other useful tools to talk about today. Smart selection. What is smart selection? When you're working with Figma, you're gonna have a lot of elements. You're gonna be moving them all over the place and smart selection will help you group items, adjust the ordering and spacing with just a click and a drag. So here we can see in this video, we can change the gap of these elements and it applies to all of the items in this row, not just the happy and excited gap. Um, the excited gap between itself and joyful also expands. And so if you have a group of objects, you wanna arrange them or space them, um, you don't need to do it manually. If they're aligned on the same axis, then you can drag to select them all and click tidy up in the right sidebar. And from there, we can hover over selection and drag the handles up or down. So what does that look like? Really quickly, I'm gonna go over here to my components. And here they are. Um, this alignment tab right here, there's a tidy up option. Um, it's not highlighted, that's okay, because it wants me to do this. And you can see right here, my elements are not tidy. Let's tidy them up. And you can see now they're spaced evenly with the option to change the drag, change the gap, excuse me, by dragging. And this pink dot, I used it before, but you can just change the ordering of your elements, like swap around. Okay, that's cool. Um, you can also reorder objects. I just did that. And you can resize objects. And you can do this multiple objects at once. Uh, click shift and plus to the objects you want to resize and then just resize them as normal. Any questions? No, okay. Grids and guides. What are grids and what are guides? These are tools that can help you align objects and just keep you more mindful about your spacing when you're designing. And so guides are lines that you can drag out to wherever you want them and to help you align things. And layout grids just align objects within a frame um, by showing you a grid. So I wanna look at grids first. So layout grids let you create consistency across your design, um, easier decisions while spacing, uh, reduce time when mocking up, and you can apply them to frames only. And so let's do that. 
So first select the frame you want to apply a grid on. On the right sidebar, click the plus to create a layout grid. So let's do that in our component here. Here's the instance. We have a layout grid option. Let's click the plus. Ah, we can see that it has created a layout grid. And I unfortunately chose red as my background color. So this grid is a little harder to see, but you can see it's there. And you can see that you can change the pixel width and also the color. So let's have a blue grid, make it darker. And let's change this to be like 20 pixels. Now our grid's larger. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can start to think how applying a grid to certain frames will help you uh, put items on them better, essentially. Help your positioning of things. And guides are helpful when you want to like mark a line and allow objects to snap to that line. So here you can see in this video example, we've created two guides along this website. And then elements can now snap to those guides that you've defined. Um, to turn the rulers on, you can do Command R. And then to apply a grid, simply drag from either the top or left ruler to create that line. See that here? No, Command R. Oh. See this ruler? And here's my horizontal grid line. And now elements can snap to that. Any questions? Cool. OK, again, I did a little bit of this already. You can play around with the grid properties, change the color, change the opacity. You can switch the direction. Is it a column or a row-like grid? And yeah, moving on to constraints. Um, only got 15 minutes left, Just trying to go a little bit faster. So maybe you've seen or already run into this problem. Um, trouble with resizing. What happens to content? So what do we want it to do? If we want the logo to always be on the top left, we should apply a constraint to it so we don't get this um, uh, weird behavior, essentially. This doesn't really work. So we can fix this. So what are, the, what are constraints? Exactly what they sound like. They constrain the element to certain positions or spots, and they keep it in the place we want. How do we add a constraint? Move that. Um, you can add a constraint here in the constraints tab to be on the left top, left bottom, center bottom, center left. There's plenty of options to choose from. I don't know if we can try that here. Right here, I've selected this temperature. And this constraint, oh, it's not going to let me do anything. That's a bummer. OK, live demo failed. But you can do this. You can do this. I promise. It exists. Oh, questions? Question slide? Right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this ruler to help with guides, can be accessed by Command-R. This pops up the ruler on the edges of the screen. It's kind of hard to see mine here. Uh, yeah, mine's not really wanting to show up a whole lot. But from there, I can just like drag a line off of this onto my page. And that'll just be there for me to like snap stuff to it. Notice how it kind of just like snaps. This line's highlighted now to tell me that this element is on this axis I've defined. Any other questions? Cool. Um, here we go. Ideation and wireframing. Very important concepts in design. Going to be doing a lot of 
coming up with ideas, putting them down, revising them, um, coming up with more ideas. You know, the design process is ever evolving. So why is wireframing so important? When you, you might have so many different ideas you want to get down when you're designing. Um, you want to try different layouts, fonts, compositions. And wireframing is a great way to just get your ideas out there on the page and see how they look. So experimenting with different ideas. These are basically the design at different stages. So sometimes these are referred to as prototypes, but generally they represent the same thing. Um, and we define these in a series of fidelity. So low fidelity, medium fidelity, and high fidelity determine the amount of details your prototypes take on. So what might that look like? Um, it's like the level of completeness. So on the left-hand side here, you can see that this person was like, yeah, there's going to be an image here roughly, and here's some text. And on the right-hand side, you can see this high fidelity prototype has evolved from the low fidelity to include a font. It has included um, you know, conscious shape. This font takes up multiple lines. And here is a choice of image with color. Um, and yeah, low fidelity is really great for just getting your ideas on the page and thinking to yourself, does this layout work? Um, do I have the right interaction for users? And high fidelity is very close to final product. So here's an example again, low, medium, high fidelity. Here's the series it takes through. And here's another example. Um, typically, low fidelity doesn't have any color or any customization. It's mostly just like blocking stuff on the page, whereas medium fidelity can start to add things like color, uh, be more conscientious about spacing. And high fidelity is really close to your final design. Again, this you want it to look pretty close, if not the same. So here we can see this high fidelity mockup pretty close to the final design. Few tweaks in color, few tweaks in layout, but relatively the idea is hammered in. There's really no change in user flow, right? All the core concepts were contained, right? Sidebar, um, these sort of row-like things for information, the progress on the right-hand side, it's all there. Questions? Question slide. No, okay. Wrapping it up, homework three um, should be out after lecture. We are going to be working with components. Glad we talked about it today because we're going to be doing a lot of it in the homework. You're going to be making Spotify. And you'll have to be doing every step of the low to high fidelity wireframing process. Lab three is going to be about pattern grids. You'll be working, oh, forgot to change the date. There you go. It's going to be a weekly occurrence, I promise. Not on Thursday. On Tuesday, you're going to be working through this with your TA. And you're going to be doing more variants. Ah, secret word. Going to be comp, short for component, C-O-M-P. Hope everyone gets that. Also, comp sci, that's what I study. You know, we're double dipping. Struggling with the originality today, I know. And also write it on the board. Ooh. Ooh. Um. Yeah, that was a lot of talking today. So thank you for bearing with me. Hopefully future lectures are actually shorter than an hour and a half. And if they are, we hope to leave like the last 20, 30 minutes to open uh, office hours time to get started with your homework and get help from myself and Katie. And yeah, if there are no more questions, I hope you all have a lovely three-day weekend and I will see you next Thursday. Thank you.